He was always the, the best player on the court in basketball. He was the most outstanding shooter that I've seen in the game to date. Rich had the best vertical jump by far. Rich was the type of ball player that could come across half court and shoot a jump shot, nothing but net. He comes in for a layup and his shoelaces flashed across my eyes. He delivered the goods year in and year out, time after time after time. It was a joyful thing to see Rich play. He was playing basketball with older kids when he was very young. We kind of tested him right away early, and then we went out behind the elementary school and played tackle Red Rover. Um, yeah, he, he stood up to us just fine. When I was playing with guys 14 when I was 8 or 9, and when I was 11, I was playing with 18-year-old guys. It was obvious at that point. He came up as a freshman, he's playing on the varsity. I mean, everybody knew what was going on. A lot of people think because you're short or small that you've got a disadvantage. If you're good and you're strong, you can do probably more than a big, because they can't, the center of gravity is too high, they can't stay with you. He played against taller guys his whole career, so uh, I never heard him say anything about uh, being bothered playing with taller guys. He's a classic example of, yes, he knew he wasn't going to be as tall as a lot of people, but he would be stronger than everyone. He was years and years and years ahead of his time lifting weights. He was lifting weights when no one was lifting weights. He was interested in uh, sort of physical culture and developing himself years before other people were. Right here I lifted weights. I had a bar and cement and I lifted them and lifted them and lifted them. I gained like 25 pounds from my freshman to sophomore year and there was no steroids or any of that junk. It was peanut butter and some steak and chocolate milk and just a lot of hard work. He was 5'7 and weighed about 160 pounds when he was a senior in high school and he could bench press over 300 pounds and uh, he was just extremely strong. Rich was always aggressive about everything he did. Till 11 or 12 at night, you know, boom, 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 Rich would be out there shooting baskets. When he was playing in the gym in basketball and taking his shots, he was never happy if the ball rattled and hit the rim a little bit. He wanted it to be all net. He wanted it to be right there. After practice was over, then he'd say, Coach, we got to shoot. And so he had a, uh, a circle of where he likes to shoot his jump shots from and he, he had to make 10 in a row from each spot or we started all over again. And I was late for dinner many, many nights because I was there shooting baskets with him. I was practicing all the time. I was doing it for fun. It was just fun. And I just, I could never get enough of it. I didn't put limits on myself. I saw that there were short guys that could jump, but not short as I was. But I just, I don't know, I had a, you know, a dream that I could go up and do that. And I, I think you have to have patience though as an athlete. You know, I couldn't do that immediately. I could touch the little loop on the net, and then I could touch the backboard, and then I could touch the brace, and then I could touch the rim. I wanted to be really good. I really wanted to be good. And when I came out on the floor, I'm sure that people who came to see me thought, that's the guy? He's, you know, <laughs> five foot seven, you know. Uh, of course, when I jumped up and dunked it, it made a little difference. And little as he was, you'd be surprised how high he got up in the air with the big fellows. <laughs> what he's got is probably the fastest first step that I've ever seen. And uh, it was just incredible how he could just take over a game at will. What would take your breath away would be the size of him and the ability that he had of jump and shoot. You wouldn't believe it.
I met Rich Jordan. He was the legend that you would tell stories about and people that didn't know about him wouldn't believe the stories. They were just too far-fetched and no one believed them, but I knew they were true. I just heard that there was this little white kid at Fenville High School that could play as well as anybody and uh, and he was really exciting to watch and that he could dunk a basketball at five foot seven. When I do paintings, when I do art pieces, I try to collect items that uh, bring memories back to me of when I played and people I saw play. So when we went to meet Rich Jordan, uh, he had all the things I needed. He had items that he had from his playing days. So he had the game ball that he used when he scored 60 points down at the Battle Creek Central Fieldhouse. He had his letter sweater. He had newspaper clippings and his jersey. I wanted to do this painting because Rich was a person that was not from a big time town, he was from a smaller town, but he was a big time legend, he was a big time name. And what a good example he is for kids today that a small guy in a small town can work hard and do great things. And I just think that's a great story. Fenville was really a beautiful little town, and it's five miles from Lake Michigan. Uh, it's a lot of apples and the cherries and, and the strawberries and it's like blueberries, and it's kind of a rural area. The time period, when you look at the 60s, and that was the early 60s, you had a lot of changes beginning to take place. But Fenville was still basically unchanged from what it was 20, 30 years before that. It was a typical small town. The town closed down when we played. I mean, they could have come in and robbed everything because there was nothing open. When I was leaving school, they were lined up at the door three, four hours before. They had them lined up from the town all the way to. And when we broke through that paper, you know what you do? And there was a crowds were standing room only. Kid, people were underneath the. And it was really a lot of fun. Rich's family, you couldn't meet better people. It was a real syndrome of the only son uh, in a family that cared about him a lot. And uh, his father, Tuffy, spent a lot of time with Rich and it was a very positive relationship. My dad really instilled so much confidence in me. He just expected me to be able to do things. He was from uh, Missouri and uh, he was a, a poor boy that had picked cotton when he was a kid, he, and he was very proud of that. He picked 500 pounds of cotton, and one day at 11 and 12 years old, he would carry it. He made the baseball team. It's in the sixth grade, the varsity team in his school. He didn't, he didn't go much further than that because he had to work, but uh, he, he was a very good athlete, and he could do triples and dive, and he could do a lot of things. He was much better than me, I think, if he'd had the same opportunities. When I was nine years old, I thought I'd, I guess you would call it a hot dog. I got into a rundown all the time and they'd throw the ball and they, then I'd run to the next base. They'd throw it and I'd run to the next base. And I took advantage of their, you know, inabilities at that point. Well, one time I got in a rundown and they threw the ball and I took off my helmet and caught the ball and they called me out. And then I threw a kind of, I didn't, <laughs> my dad saw that. That was all he needed. He came down out of his car, came and grabbed me by the back of my pants as I was kicking and he carried me up to the car and put me in the car and told me if I ever acted like that again, I'd never play another sport, ever. Tuffy was my second father. We'd sit down and talk about things, and, and Tuffy was there kind of as a, a stable force. Uh, he set certain boundaries that we adhered to only because we knew that uh, this was a pretty important person in our life. They were wonderfully supportive of all of Fendel's athletics, and uh, they knew that their son was the star, but they always encouraged all of the rest of the, the players to do their best and to try to improve. And they just treated me with the utmost respect and act like they loved me. His dad was, was my best friend, and whenever I'd see him somewhere, you know, 
That was just that relationship. My father, the first thing we did, he, of course, he put in a basketball court for me. And he did this himself. He laid the, the cement down himself, put it in. But this doesn't look very big, but we've had six foot eight guys on here, six foot nine. There was people over there all the time, and there were people over there playing basketball all the time. We played basketball all the time. Or in the winter, there was people over there playing electric football. And The gathering point was Richie's house. We used to play wiffle ball over there. Always had a basketball game going on with music. It was a gathering point. And we'd play basketball, and we'd have Kool-Aid and listen to records after school, and uh, just got to be a real kind of a family. They were so sociable, you know. Uh, it was just more or less, we went to Fenville, we went over to Rich Jordan's house. We used to have some real good games. In the 50s and 60s, when we were all growing up, being Jewish was more difficult. There was a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot. I had a, a few anti-Semitic things over the years, but nothing like this particular night. I come into this place, and they got a signs up. We're gonna get you to night number 12, you Jew, and all this stuff. And I took the ball out of bounds, and the one lady pulled the hair on the back of my legs and spit on my shoulder and said, we're gonna get you, Jew. And I mean, I couldn't believe what was going on, and they weren't doing anything about it. The referee was like he didn't see it, he didn't hear it. And so I went home to my mother and I said, Ma, they were calling me a Jew, Billy, because my dad was from the South, my mother's Jewish. She said, what are you mad about? That's what you are. He never tried to hide the fact that he was Jewish. You know, at that time, a lot of Jews did not wear their religion on their sleeve because of all the, all the anti-Semitism. They would have a low profile. And, um, and he did. Well, when I was in the seventh grade, I started going to Hebrew lessons because at 13, I wanted to have a bar mitzvah. And I get a record, it's called the Haftorah, that you have to uh, sing in the, at, at the, uh, your bar mitzvah. Uh, these guys, my buddies, were learning it with me. Now, these guys were all Gentile, and they had it as good. Uh, you could hear them all, Baruch, Hatah, I don't know. And they could all do this, they could all sing it. His teammates learned his Haftorah. <laughs> which is pretty incredible. I first heard about Rich Jordan when I was in the seventh grade, and a coach happened to be my math teacher. And I will never forget him making the statement that right now, in Fenville, Michigan, there's a kid in the sixth grade by the name of Richie Jordan, who he thought could play on any varsity team in the state as a sixth grader. He was always pushing himself. Could I go a little higher, a little faster? And I had just never forgotten that. And I've always said and have written about uh, that time and what he did. Uh, I even wrote a fairy tale about him uh, called Court Royalty, which kind of summed up for me what Rich was all about. And I said in the conclusion of the written piece, he could really fly. And oh, how he could fly. And he could. We'd never seen anything quite like him. Rich had a unique jump shot. He would jump and sort of fold his legs up in his shot with one hand. He was absolutely the purest shooter that I've, I've ever seen. His shot could not be taught. He just learned that. And, you know, everybody asked me, oh, yeah, I taught him to do that. Well, I didn't teach him how to do that. If you're a basketball purist, there are certain things that are supposed to happen mechanically. His jump shot is effectively arm-wise about as pure mechanically as it gets. So it was always a pleasure to watch him shoot. What I try to do is I try to reach up with my arm, let my wrist drop over, and boom, it's in. And 
the strength of my hands and arms and things made it easy because I didn't use two, you know, I only used one hand. He was just an outstanding shooter. As I always tell him, I'd never remember seeing you miss. Every time you go up to shoot, it would always go in. As an opponent, uh, playing against someone like Richie, he made you play your best game. There's one play that stands out in my mind that I've remembered over 50 years. He came down, put the ball on the floor maybe three times, dribble, 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 and he went straight up in the face of a 6'2", good defender, and held the ball in one hand and cradled it and waited till the defender started to come down and he just flicked his wrist. That, that shot was fr from right around here, from right about here. It's a long way. Every time that he had the ball and you thought it's gonna go in and it could be 10 footers, it could be 18 footers, it could be 28 footers. Anytime the ball's in his hands and you think it's going up, it's going in. It would be amazing to find out, and it's impossible to do so, but how many points that he might have scored had they had the three-point line. Because I can remember one time his senior year, there were several college scouts at a game at uh, Hopkins, and uh, he missed his first couple three shots. And then he made 15 in a row from the middle of the second quarter till halftime. And every one of those would have been three-point shots. Instead of having 30 points at halftime, he would have had 45 points at halftime. Some people would have thought that Rich was arrogant. But where do you separate arrogance or confidence? I mean, he knew he was good. Even in warm-ups, you saw something in his demeanor that this guy just has that certain thing. He wasn't your average high school player. Richie was focused. He was already thinking about what he wanted to do, how he was gonna do it. He was in game mode right from the get-go. His demeanor never changed. Didn't pout, didn't you know, be disgusted or anything. Just come back down and shoot it the same way. He uh, had no real outward signs of emotion. He could miss three shots, he could make five in a row. You would never know it. You know, I've probably talked to a hundred people over my lifetime who said, geez, that guy must have been a real ball hog to score 44 points. He was anything but a ball hog. The thing about with our team is everybody knew what they were supposed to do. And everybody did what they were supposed to do. If you'd watched us play, the ball moved around a lot, a lot of fast breaks, and all of us had some pretty good speed. We, were, we all got our hands on the ball at various times. It, it wasn't kind of just feed Rich and let him shoot. Because you don't do these things by yourself, you know. And if a person was open, they got the ball from me. It would be a pleasure to play with somebody like Rich because he'd dish it off to you. And, you know, you just had to be smart enough to be in the right place and you'd get an easy basket. And it was never all about me. It was, let's win this game as a team. Well, the first time I met Rich, I was just a young boy, and from that very beginning, it was evident that um, Richie Jordan had some incredibly God-gifted talent. I was a combat medic in Vietnam. I received the Medal of Honor. On May the 13th, 1969, we were to go into uh, Tam Ki and be a blocking force for a track unit that was gonna come over the hill. They're firing at us, we get two helicopters shot down. Well, I noticed one guy lagging behind. So once he went down, I jumped up, automatic. I mean, that's my job, right? I was taught from a very young age, if you're given a job, you don't do it halfway. If you're given a job, you do the best you can do, and you do it until the end. You know, that's kind of the way I feel about Richie Jordan, you know, that Yes, I've told people in the military, I told people in Vietnam, you won't believe this guy that I grew up with. You will not believe that a young man at a high school age uh, and five foot seven and a half could do what this man did 
in his high school career. We were supposed to play them the home game. They were supposed to come to Fenville. But the Kalamazoo people were so excited about our team and myself making these points that they made it. They suggested that we played in the Kalamazoo Western Michigan Fieldhouse. I can remember the bus ride over, and we were excited because I'd been in Reed Fieldhouse a couple times uh, in, in high school track meets, and we knew that there had been a lot of people. Well, we come in from Fenville to this big arena. It was so exciting, you know, I'd never been on a college court. And the place was chuck full, and I don't know, somewhere around 10,000 people in there. And these kids had never played in a crowd like that. And uh, they were so nervous, I got them in the locker room as quick as I could, and we got dressed. When we went onto the floor, it was a different experience than any of us had ever had because there were so many people there. That's still the most well-attended game in the history of that field house. So, we start the game, and we're just terrible. In these big basketball arenas, the baskets are kind of freestanding. And, you know, in the small gyms, you got a wall behind it, you know. So they couldn't hardly hit the rim, including Rich. We got off to a little bit of a shaky start, and part of it was they were using a brand new basketball, which is really what you don't do because it was very slippery. And so we were having a difficult time handling it. I was six for 12 in the first half. I had 13 points. And they were booing. And people were sitting next to my parents and, my, and they were you know, saying, oh, this guy, you know, they, I came from St. Louis, Missouri to see this. This guy's not. And they're beating us by 10, 18 points, I think. Well, I think Rich had maybe 12 points, but he probably shot 25 times to get him in the first half. He turned the ball over. Yeah, I mean, we were awful. In the third quarter, we got off to a slow start, and we got behind, oh, I can't remember, maybe by uh, 10 points, maybe 10 or 12 points. But halfway through the third quarter, we began to get back to the cycle of running, and uh, that began to turn the tide. It was like someone took my arm and started shooting it for me. Everything started going in. And the guys were playing, you know, rebound. We were working, and we came back. Rich shot uh, several very key shots, very long shots, and, uh, and so that drew them out where we could start driving the ball to the basket and gradually whittled away at it. I ended up having 24 in the last quarter, 36 for the second half, and we beat them 76 to 72. Rich and I were talking one day and he started going into all these stories in the past. And I was sitting and listening to these amazing stories of his athleticism and the anti-Semitism that he faced. And I thought, you know, you need to be on the wall in the synagogue. You know, we need to have a place for you. People should know all of this. We got a narrative of uh, some of the things that uh, Richie went through and a picture of him. And then Richie put together a compilation of his awards that we've got here. His mom kept a scrapbook of all his accomplishments, and uh, I took some of the things out of the newspapers, articles, uh, and put together his history. The one that touches me the most is this one on the bottom. This was a, uh, a quote from the Kalamazoo Gazette. It says, Michigan high school basketball will never be quite the same. It, it touches me really deeply. It's, it's Richie Jordan played his final game. Fanville is home. Uh, the people there, uh, they've just treated me like uh, I was very special. Uh, they named the town after me for a day. You know, how many kids at that age get that kind of recognition? When you mention Fenville, you think of Richie Joy. Richie was just a great player. 
We all wanted to be remembered. We wanted to be the greatest team that ever came out of there. That's what we wanted. Playing for your hometown is different than playing for your college team or your professional team because the people in that small town, they know you. They know you. They're not cheering for the logo or the memorabilia they can take home after the game. They know you as a person. It was a wonderful experience, a wonderful time of life. You know, it's something you never, you'll never get that kind of feeling back. It was a great time while it lasted. It was great.